Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. Welcome to the Clutter Fairy Weekly for August 4th, 2020. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. It's the dog days of August here. Um, we are the Clutter Fairy Weekly webcast and podcast that we do every week to talk about all things organizing. And we appreciate so much that you go on to all of our channels and put your topic ideas and ask questions and tell us what you care about and what you want to hear about. And we use those to uh, steer our ship about what we're going to talk about each week. If you're joining us in Zoom for the first time, you can share your comments and questions via the chat and I'll try to make sure Gail gets to them before we move on to another topic. You can use the raise hand feature to let me know if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. We're also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share your questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. And during the live webcast each week, you can talk to us directly by calling 669-900-6833, Use meeting ID 993-419-863 to join the meeting. In several of our meetings, we've talked about trying to detour around our emotional responses to things by cultivating detachment and objectivity through the creation of sorting algorithms, rules to filter our stuff to fit our spaces and our present lives. In response to that, we've had a few questions about how to deal with regret. Most recently, YouTube viewer Jenna asked, how do you know if you'll regret a rule you made? I've really regretted things I've purged in the past. Gail, what do you say to people who've made decluttering choices that they later regretted? I thought this was such a great question and I, I wrote a response, but it, I found that I had way more to say than I had the time to write. So this was a perfect one for us to talk about today. Lots of people say to me, I gave it away and then I needed it three weeks later or I've give, I gave that away and I've regretted it for 20 years. And we find ourselves having thought, oh, I had that thing and I got rid of it. And so the question is, when you feel like you've made a mistake, how do you deal with it? And, and I think the better question is, how do you alter the questions uh, that you're asking yourself? How do you alter the filtering process so that you are sure that you won't regret it later? And so there's a perception issue at the back end and there's a decision process at the front end. I, I said to her on the comments that I wanted her to think about when you are picking your items, this is going to stay, this is going to go. What kind of questions are you asking yourself? And are you certain that you are being very thorough and careful about how you make those choices. Sometimes people give away things just to be getting stuff off the table. It is a stress response and it is a, you know, I'm dealing with the work and I need to get rid of stuff and okay, let's just, you know, you give up being thoughtful in service of speed and process and getting done with the job, right? Like you don't, you just don't want to be doing the chore anymore. And so, okay, fine. Get da, 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 da. You talk yourself into letting go of stuff. But I think if you find that you are living with regret, then I think that it reflects the fact that you are needing to be a little bit more careful up front when you are thinking about what can go. And it isn't whether you can imagine ever needing, ever needing this ever, it's really whether you can imagine that the thing that you have in your hand is going to serve some future part of your life. But let me restate that. It's going to serve your current life sometime in the future. However you're living your life, whatever things are going on in your life, whatever activities your family is doing, however you are in school or going to work, whatever is current and popular for you is happening and being supported by or not supported by the stuff that you have around you. And so you don't want to just make the decision to cast it off so you don't have to think about it anymore today. <laughs> I think it's much more important to be thoughtful in service to your future self and really think about do I actually want this thing? Do I really like it? I mean, I've had people, I have this experience where I'm working with people sometimes where 
I'm asking them questions. I'm standing there holding this object in front of a person and I'm saying, do you like this? Do you love it? Do you want it? When do you use it? I'm running through my usual questions and I'm sort of getting, ah, no, you can get rid of that. And then I see the hesitation on their face and I'm like, are you sure? Like, why are you saying that to me right now? <laughs> if you are hesitating out of I'm overwhelmed and I want to keep everything. That's one thing. But if you're hesitating because there's some part of you that feels like I really think this, I really think this is a keepsake and I'm not using it now, but this reminds me of my mother or this makes me feel, here's a perfect example. This mug came from my mother's house. It was a coffee cup that she used all the time and I brought this home, it's a coffee cup. It's not a fancy coffee cup, but it makes me think of her. And so this is a cup that I use regularly. If I had been seeing this coffee cup amongst 20 coffee cups in somebody's house, I would have asked, do you want this one? Do you love it? Do you keep it? And I wouldn't know that that coffee cup reminds you of your mother. You have to know why you are attached to things and how important that attachment is. And you have to evaluate whether it can continue to live with you or not based on that attachment. And, you know, this is the, this is the flip side of, you don't want to keep everything either, <laughs> but, but when you decide to let them go, you want to make sure that it's stuff that they don't serve your current life. They don't, they're not going to be, you're retired and you don't do that anymore. You're not going to need those clothes. You're not going to need that, you know, 47,000 things of Christmas. <laughs> and so <laughs> evaluating that stuff for what you actually want in your current life is an important, thoughtful decision to make. And occasionally you will make mistakes. I mean, that's the bottom line. It's no different than one of the things that I brought was, one of the things I brought from my mother's house was a vase and it was a really pretty vase blown glass that she had used as the color palette to decorate her house. And I ended up with a little bit of that furniture. And so I wanted the vase and of course the cats knocked it off and shattered it into a million pieces. So this is one of those keepsakes that I really wish I still have. And I regret that I lost it and I can't do anything about it. And I just have to live with that. And occasionally you will give things away. And then you will think later, oh, I had that. Why did I give it away? Yeah. Sometimes you're going to give up something that you did your best to evaluate in the moment. And then six months down the road or two years down the road or whatever, you're going to think, oh, darn, I should have that. But truthfully, if you have a couple of regrets out of a lifetime of donation, I think that you can stand in a position of, I'm doing, I'm at 98% success. <laughs> That's pretty good. If you only regret one or two things that you've let go of, and it just means that you were in a bad place that day, or you didn't have good focus, or you were too tired, and you sort of made a bad decision. It's just like any other bad decision in your life accept and move on, right? Accept that you're a fallible human and you made a mistake and move on. That even you could regret things for things against your will, like the cat shattered my vase and I regret that and there's nothing I can do about it and I just live with that. And I moved on and I have a coffee mug for mother instead. So it's not like I don't remember my mother and, and I'm okay from the loss of the vase, sad about it, but I'm okay. And you can accept that you made a couple of decisions that were not in your best interests and move on. It is the nature of life that we don't, we're not 100% successful at all that we do. And sometimes you're gonna goof and something's gonna go out the door. And <clears throat> accepting that you're human and accepting that the process of letting things go and living in a more manageable space is much more beneficial to you than the possibility of a future regret, I guess. The value of your 
manageable living space is so much more important to your well-being in your life and your health than I gave away that one thing that now I'm sorry that I gave away. And <clears throat> so I guess I'm saying in answer to that question, how do you deal with regret? A, be really thoughtful as you give things away and make sure that you're comfortable with it. And if you're not comfortable, then stop and ask yourself what's going on. And then B, if you do make a mistake, then chalk it up to the cat broke the vase. <laughs> it's, it's happened, it's done, and there's nothing you can do about it. And accept that while this one thing is something that you regret, the other 9,995 things you gave away have been successful releases. And it's worth the effort to continue to do that, even if you accumulate a regret or two along the way. And that's a very long-winded <laughs> way to answer that question, but I thought it was worth discussing all of the process along the way because there's all kinds of reasons and things that we regret in the world, and sometimes decluttering will be one of those things. And well, on and, we go. <laughs> and perhaps to counter the negative emotion of regret, you have to take a moment to focus on what you gained Mm -hmm. by your decluttering by the process right the space you freed up the freedom to do things that you wanted to do the money you're saving the guest room you reclaimed the counter space that's now usable the focus, free time you have the free time focus your attention there and forgive yourself to the extent that you're able to do that Forgiving is a good per, a good part of that process. Thank you for saying our, that. I think that regret is important to be forgiven. Well, in our conversations about sorting algorithms, the the whole point of having of creating some algorithms, creating rules, is to try and take the emotional uh, the emotional context out to you know to to set aside the emotion. And maybe you can add to your algorithm when you're dealing with highly emotional stuff, sentimental stuff, hmm. a question about, is this thing genuinely irreplaceable? Because that you might want to make that a, make a stricter rule about that if something is genuinely irreplaceable because it was, they don't make them anymore or it was made by hand, it was made by someone you know, it, it is very old, it's unique, then hang on to it or set it aside, put it in a let me think about this some more pile. Um, and, and generally if you are we want you to be able to move forward and the algorithms are always arbitrary questions that are trying to give you some cutoff points to be able to release things, to give you some parameters, but you have to make sure that you're happy with what you're giving away before you release it into the wild. <laughs> and a viewer in uh, Zoom asked, do you make an I don't know yet pile if so how long do you leave that pile sometimes people so the short answer is yes you can make a think about it pile and the only problem with the think about it pile is when everything goes in the think about it pile if yeah, you, you are if you're picking it project. up <laughs> and everything goes in the think about it pile then you're defeating the purpose of the process right <laughs> karen said I recycled some Janis Joplin posters, envelopes from hair, et cetera, and have regretted it because I could have sold them instead. But the amount of money I would have gotten is not worth the regret I've felt. And and you released them in the wild and somebody found them and found them for a song and a steal and what and is now holding them as the prize possession in their collection. And so um you don't know who that person is, but you made somebody super, super happy one day because they found your item. And so, um, you know, you didn't get the money out of it, but you gave away the blessing and the, the fun and the excitement and thrill for somebody else to experience it. And that was uh, a worthy thing to do. 
and and then you get it you you know whenever you regret the money you didn't make you're really regretting that you couldn't get money out of it for um for free and not very much work and not much hassle and the truth is the money baked into stuff requires action and motion and um lots of work on your part most of the time to get the money out of the item and if you don't have that kind of time in your life it's not going to be something that you can materialize in your life and so letting it go is a and not regretting the money is you're basically trading off my time is more valuable than the money i could get out of this from all the work that i have to do to get the money out of it and you're making a conscious choice there that yeah that money is not worth my effort and i'm releasing that into the wild and letting somebody else have it to play with it and good job because you're valuing your free time and your other responsibilities and your other activities above squeezing the you know the last dime out of the object that you gave away there's that enough answer to that question <laughs> i think so cynthia mentioned taking pictures or sketching the things you're iffy about can help and i found when i was clearing out my house the sent some of the sentimental stuff just talking about it to you and the people who are helping me clear the house i told there were things i told stories about and then as soon as i had a story about it i sort of felt like you know I'm, I'm never i'm never going to forget that so i don't really need this little thing to help me remember that yeah like the object triggered the story but the story is in your head the story's not in the object right right exactly yeah 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 i mean we sort of keep things as what's the word um triggers anchors yeah yeah or um yeah i'm not sure that touchstones <laughs> right okay we better get on to our featured topic or we're going to run out of time okay if you're a fashionista your closets are probably bursting at the seams the ever-changing nature of style compels fashion devotees to buy the latest and greatest and yesterday's get pushed aside if this compulsion goes unchecked, it can lead to cluttered closets and overflowing drawers. Our topic today is the rose-colored mirror, clutter in the quest for style. So let me ask you some questions to see if you are one of those overwhelmed fashionistas or an overwhelmed interior decorator. Question number one, what does your closet look like? Can you put your clothes away after the wash? Can you do it easily without cursing? <laughs> <laughs> do you bring home shopping bags full of new clothes that end up on the bottom of the closet forever? Do you sneak clothes in from the car, like out of the trunk and sneak it in and stash them in the closet so your husband doesn't see them? If you have a dresser, can you open and close the drawers really easily or are you shoving more things in? Are there clothes on the rod that still have tags on them? You know there are, and I have pulled a lot out. Can you see the floor of your closet at all? <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have lots of seasonal home decor stored in random closets and pieces of furniture? Is every surface in your home covered in random decorative objects? If you answered yes to some of these questions, you might be drowning in style. And what causes the closets and furniture to explode? We buy things because it's fun or it's on sale or it's so cute. We ignore the existing contents of the closet and ignore whether we need it or not. We already have 10 pairs of cute black pants, but this pair is newer and current and it's from this season. We buy something or everything new each season to stay hip and trendy. The industry has built a sustaining business model what is cool today is passe tomorrow, requiring that you rebuy everything all the time. They created an artificial need so that you buy even though you don't actually need it. Then you'll buy even though the clothes you have still fit and they aren't worn out, which is great for them and bad for you. <laughs> We're very reasonably have issues with getting rid of perfectly good clothes. You might buy into the fun of getting new stuff, but most people don't feel comfortable letting good clothes go. The old clothes, clothes aren't worn out. 
you just bought most of them and maybe you've had them on a few times over a month or two or that season, but way before they actually need replacing, you're already on the next shopping trip. The fashion industry doesn't care about your closet, only that you keep buying regardless of actual need. What you do with the excess doesn't matter to them since they've already parted you from your money. There's the same issue with linens and towels and decor items for the living room. It's easy and fun to buy what's new, but it's hard to get rid of perfectly good things once they're, once they're replaced. The stores keep putting out new fall decor, even though you have an entire hall closet full of it. So how does the closet function after it's cluttered? Well, you know the answer to this, it absolutely does not function anymore. It renders your closet unusable. You can't walk in or reach inside. You can't get your clothes put away after the wash is done, which is the most annoying thing ever. You can't put things back in the drawers or on the shelves and the floor is always covered. At this point, you start looking to stash things away. And that means you're stuffing things in random corners or on cabinets, on shelves or in cabinets. I found some decor, decor items, you know, tchotchke things that are supposed to sit out parked in really weird places to attempt to stash it away. But after you do that, it's gone into the black hole and you don't remember that you have it anymore. Often you can't find all the pieces of an outfit when you want to wear it. The belt is missing or you can't find the matching, matching shirt. Getting dressed in the morning is a nightmare. Like all two cluttered spaces, you rebuy things a second or a third time when you can't find something. There is a place where, there's a place in your mind where figuring out where you stash that object is much, much harder than going and buying it new. And so people start replacing things to avoid the hassle of locating things, which is uh, great for a capitalist society, but not really great for your pocketbook or your ability to live in your space. You end up, at some point, you start forgetting what you have, and then you end up buying a new item that's very similar to an old one because you're not willing to go find it in the stash. So <clears throat> this is sort of a discussion of the problem of accumulating style. Now let's talk about the process of changing. What do you get from clearing it out and changing your shopping habits? Well, top of the list, you save money. You don't buy too much, you don't double buy, you don't throw out as much, you use what you have. The sort of extreme version of that is going minimalist, but there's just sort of a mid-level regular person version of that where you use what you have, you don't shop as quickly, you don't buy things in multiples, and you have less to throw out because you have less coming in. You save time when you make this change because it's easier to find things and you spend a whole lot less time shopping. I think that um, we, some people have been forced to experience this in the short term because of the pandemic that we haven't been out running around in stores because it hasn't, some of us don't feel like it's safe, some of us, uh, don't want to congregate in groups like you do in a store. And so you're spending a whole lot less time shopping and adding impulse shopping and adding things to the pile rapidly. And you're having the experience of what it's like to not be shopping constantly. And I think that that's probably been an interesting experience for some people. <laughs> um, another Benefit you get from making a change around this is that your laundry day is going to get a thousand times easier. It's easier to put clean things away and it's so much less frustrating. You can accomplish the task quickly and hassle free. Who doesn't want that? No more struggling to put items away and hanging clothes is a breeze. How great to shorten that chore as much as possible. And how many times have you done the laundry pulled it out of the dryer, folded it or hung it up, put it on hangers, and then it goes towards the closet, but it never actually gets in the closet because you can't put it away. Because the process of putting it away is too much of a struggle. And so you end up 
creating clean clothes and then leaving them in the clo the clothes hamper or the basket and then you know the cats sleep on them and the dogs sleep on them and you, you fish clean clothes out of the basket without ever actually getting them into the closet and if you can thin that process out thin the herd out in the closet you can actually complete this the life cycle of washing drying folding hanging putting away and then you're not living with a bunch of ba baskets with um you know ostensibly clean clothes sitting out waiting to be worn again i see a lot of baskets of oh those are clean clothes sitting right outside a closet waiting to go in somewhere <laughs> and then and why aren't these put away well because i can't get in the closet i've heard that a million times if you can see all the clothes then choosing what to wear is certainly faster and easier you can find all the pieces of an outfit when you want them you have enough to worry about in the morning choosing what to wear should be a no-brainer and if you can't get into the closet or it's so stuffed that you can't find all the pieces you're just making your morning more aggravating <laughs> and for somebody who is a night owl you know my morning needs to be super smooth because i don't my brain is not turning on while i'm trying to get dressed if you're a morning person you have a little bit more on the ball to play with in the morning but do you really want to spend extra time getting dressed in the morning because you can't find something even if you're awake <clears throat> so how do you change your quest for style let's start with a purge you know i'm going to tell you to start with purging things out it's time to unbury the floor empty any shopping bags you find and hang up the new clothes and match up and purge the shoes get ready to try on your clothes <laughs> don't keep a million sizes keep what fits keep your current favorites only in one size up or down and let the rest go the farther away from your current size the less you you should keep and I know that someday you're going to lose all the weight and you're going to be able to put all this clothes back on. But the truth is, the farther away that size is from where you are, the longer it's going to take for you to get there. And so the clothes will be aging while you're losing weight. So you might as well keep a representative sample of the sizes that are too far away and let most of that go and let somebody else that needs them wear them right now. You know, I'm always going to say that somebody else needs to be wearing your clothes if you're not wearing them. Pull out the non-clothing items being stored in your closet, and I'm talking about your clothes closets here. Why is this object here? How often do you need it? Could it be donated? If you need to keep it, can it be placed on a shelf overhead or in the back corner of the closet? So we all stash random things in our closets in our bedrooms, and some of it's, you know, hide things from the kids. <laughs> some of it is I'm going to get to that later or this is where um, what I do without a season but you want to make sure that the things that you have stashed in the random corners of the closet make sense in that closet and aren't just things that are hidden and forgotten about so now's the time to go through and pull those things down and go oh yeah I stuck this up here and I forgot about it right <clears throat> make some room get rid of it uh, you also want to address emptying out uh, any other non-clothing closets, the linen closets, the storage closets, and the furniture that you have decorative items stuffed in, right? Decorative items that have been retired from your decor need to move on to somebody else's living room. Christmas storage needs to be out of the way as much as possible. And you can say, I say Christmas because I'm in the United States, and that's a big... Uh, part of the population I deal with here is people that have Christmas stash. But everybody has their own winter holiday decor that <laughs> they have to deal with whatever your flavor. So you can just substitute your flavor when I'm saying Christmas. <laughs> you need to gather like seasonal decor together and see how much you have. How many Halloween um, decorations do you have? How much fall decor do you have? How much spring or Easter decor do you have? pull it all together see how much it is if you have 47 pieces of easter decor and you can only put out five what's the point of having 47 so really you've just been buying stuff because it's cute over time and you have a lifetime of easter decor and it's time to look at the whole population and pick your favorites the ones that you always like to put out or then, you know, you've got a new one and it's fresh and you want to put a new one out, which means it's time to retire something else. This is a process of 
filter, 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 because the ceramic object that you have or the silk flowers that you have or the little plaque that hangs on the wall, it's not broken, it's not wearing it out, it's not going anywhere. So you're either gonna have to give up space to it or send it on its way. Time to donate the rest, yes. You're going to find some items that you've deemed keepsakes. So as you're pulling things out of closets, you're gonna find the one thing that you went and stuck in a corner because it was a keepsake to you. I think it's important that keepsakes don't get mixed in with the rest of your regular life. So if it's if you're keeping it and the la it's the last reason that you're keeping it because it's a keepsake because it is a precious memory and you don't want it out on display hanging on the wall you don't want it where you can see it all the time then I think it's important to take all that keepsake stuff and box it together and park it someplace out of the way and this is what you do with the very very top shelf in your closets or under the bed or in the you know corner where you have to crawl on your hands and knees in the closet to go stick something in the corner. I think keepsakes, unless you're somebody that goes and touches and fondles them all the time, keepsakes are things that I want them, they're part of my family history, they're part of my memories and I wanna keep them and I'm gonna go um, stash them out of the way, but not fondle them, go go put them in a box that only has keepsakes and nothing else. You don't want them mixed in with other active life and put them in a corner. Then you want to organize what's left. You want to sort the clothes, the way that you get dressed. You want all the linens together. The less you use something, the farther up or in the back or behind you, you store it. Um, store decor by the season. So when it's time to trade it for a new season, you have all the current season items easy, easy to grab then start the one in one out rule on these types of objects. If you find a new must have fall item, then another fall item probably needs to go. This is a process of recognizing that you are going to, if you love fall and you are triggered by fall and you're going to keep going to buy fall, then you know, that, ex that collection is just going to be ever expanding. We talked about collections, right? It's just going to keep growing. And at some point you're going to have to let some of it go back out. I see that there's a lot going on in the chat. So does anybody want to chime in? Who has a question for me, Ed? Patricia said, my living room is a giant closet now because closets are full. Clothes are my number one issue. Oh, yeah. And, and I said, um, the first step is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you know, the older that we get, if you are bringing clothes in and you're not letting them go out, then it, you know you're just building your store into an ever growing thing and this is the time to start letting stuff go just to look at it this way if you stand there and look at your collection of clothing imagine that you are deceased and that your family is standing there looking at that collection of clothing and they are going to have to carry it all out they are going to have to cry and carry out a store's worth of, they're going to have to divest your store of all the clothes that you have. And what an incredible burden to put on your family. <laughs> it might be time to start moving some of it out yourself. Deborah said, last year I wrote myself a clothing manifesto. Oh. She said, I was doing a seasonal sort and looked sharply at all the keepers and identified the factors of the keepers, color, length, placement of darts, sleeve length, fabric, neckline, et cetera. I only purchase clothes which meet my manifesto. So that's uh, sort of a, you know, that's sort of like a front end sorting algorithm, how to avoid right? buying stuff that you're gonna, going to regret having added to your collection because it doesn't fit the style, the <laughs> aesthetic that you've established for yourself. Well, and every new fashion um, isn't, doesn't work for everybody. <laughs> like sometimes we jump on the bandwagon because it's the new cool thing or color or fabric or shape of clothing. And we all think, oh, I want to have that. Isn't that so cool? And sometimes you have to go, yeah, but I'm flat chested and that only works on big chested people or 
I am short and that only works on someone who's tall or my neck is not thin enough for that. Being able to evaluate a style and look at it and go, I know this is current and hip, but this will look like crap on me. It does not work with my body style. It does not work with my face shape. It does not work with my skin color. You have to recognize that all fashion cannot work on every person. And we have all seen those um, fashion uh, faux pas, people walking out in the world wearing the current thing and you're looking at them and thinking, she should not be wearing that. That thing looks terrible on him. That is a horrible color for her. You can tell out in the world that some things are bad choices for you. <laughs> For whoever, you know, we, we, we are not all shapes and sizes in one body. We all have, um, you know, our slice of the pie. And sometimes our slice of the pie doesn't work with the current fashion. And so how great that you are filtering up front, Deborah, because that means that you're preventing things from coming in that then you would have to turn around and let go of on the other side. So good job for you. That's awesome. I also see somebody um, says uh, Marie Kondo makes a pile to the ceiling, like pull everything out and look at it all so that you have some idea of how incredibly much you actually have. Well, there was a question about, do, do you favor hanging or folding? Can you, can you fit more folding things or hanging things? And Petra said, I don't really know, uh, but, but feel that by hanging, you lose quite a bit of space underneath the clothes. Well, and I think the, the bigger question is the concept of fitting more in the space maybe is the misnomer. You can always put cram more into a closet. You can always make <laughs> like you can always wedge more in but the more, the tighter that it gets and the more um, compactly stored things are, the more that's shoved into the cube, the harder it gets to take things out, maneuver, see everything. Like you're, the, the tighter it gets, the less uh, flexible and uh, usable it becomes. You're, you're sliding away from, I can see all and use all to, I can store all permanently in the storage container. And so you do want to sort of keep that line in your head about how hard am I adding it so much that it's going to be that much harder for me to get things in and out. In theory, you're cramming it full because you want to see everything and wear everything. But if wearing everything is impossible because you can't easily get it in and out or you are somebody who is frustrated by how hard it is to get it in and out, then you've created a set that you then cannot actually use. So you do want to keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, Stashing it and um, in increasing your capacity may also increase your frustration. What do you think of the minimalist capsule wardrobe? 33 oh. items total. Yeah, I mean, if somebody is into that, that's a complete mind shift, right? Like that is that is the definition of, um, you know, you live with a very, very small collection of clothing and you rewear them over and over and over again. And then you don't spend money on clothes and you don't have a whole huge variety. And so if this is something that you could live with, awesome. You'll have plenty of room in your closet. <laughs> it will be It will be all kinds of air up in there. Um, go for it if you could do it. I, I'm not sure that everybody can make that mind shift. It, it does require an agreement that you like, like it's 1945 and you're going to wear the same suit over and over and over and over and over again. I see another comment too. Um, the question to ask yourself, would I buy this today? If you look at things in your closet and you can answer that question, would I buy this today? If the answer is no, then it's probably time to send it on. That's a very good way to filter it. Like if I wouldn't see this in the store right now and buy it right now and wear it, then why am I keeping it? Cause it's never coming out of the closet again. Cynthia said a smart friend helped me some years ago. And one rule we 
made was that pants with pleats, no, they are just fattening to me. And she, <laughs> she talked about getting rid of outliers. Very helpful. Um, now I have my closet mostly organized by color and mostly solids, neutrals, the black sections, browns, grays, and that's most of my work wardrobe. I call it adult garanimals. Uh, adult garanimals, that's awesome. Well, but it's a great idea of, you know, you know what colors you like to wear and match together. And so you uh, set it up so you can grab in that in each of those sections. That's awesome. I have sort of an adult garanimals thing going on too because – I have a very limited palette of colors and mostly shorts, and mostly cargo shorts and t-shirts. Everything, <laughs> everything goes with everything. Right? <laughs> yeah, you have that I work from home life wardrobe. Yes. <laughs> right? So yeah. before the pandemic, Ed has always worked from home. He's self-employed and he always works from his, uh, works on his computer from his chair. So he has not had to have a professional wardrobe for some time, and it's quite shocking when he shows up in a dress shirt and jeans or something. Everybody's sort of like, whoa, something's going on. What's happening? Ed has shoes on. <laughs> Who died? Do you have a Who funeral died? to go to? Yeah. <laughs> Every once in a while, he has to go to a business meeting, and he puts on a very nice dress shirt, and everybody's quite shocked by that. Ever says, I, I love the idea of a uniform like men have suits. Women are right, and – Women, women have tried to do that. Variety. Yeah, I mean, there have been some women that have tried to do that and just like pick a style of clothing or a type of dress or a dress and they, you know, buy 10 of them and they just keep wearing it over and over again so that they're not having to make wardrobe decisions every day. I mean, I think it is something that, um, you know, the, the, benefit of uniforms is you don't have to think about it and I get up every day and put on a scrub top that says it has the color furry logo on it and and jean shorts in the summer and long pants in the winter and that is and tennis shoes and I'm going to wear that five days a week four or five days a week and so on those mornings I'm not struggling with what am I going to wear and what matches and oh my gosh and where's the belt and I'm not having I'm not spending any of my morning time um, worrying about it and and there is some benefit to that and in a in a very professional environment where you know you're having to put on business clothes you can create your own uniform by particular picking a particular style and just wearing that style every day to work and you know, people have tried it. Very successful people have tried it so that they're not putting any bandwidth into thinking about their clothing. And, and you know what? If you're one of those people and you have really important things to think about, clothing is pretty far down the list of important, valuable thoughts, right? Karen says, I have some wonderful clothes that fit me beautifully, but I don't wear those for my current work or go to places that would be appropriate for me. But they stay in my closet because they fit, look great on me, and are good clothes. Any pointers? Yeah, this is the um, my life has transitioned away from stuff that looks fabulous um, conversation. Um, it happens a lot when people retire, right? Uh, where you have been wearing business clothes all day long every day. You had you worked at a bank and you had to put a suit on every day. And then you retire and now you have this whole wardrobe built around something that you will never do again. <laughs> so recognizing that the volume of those clothes is probably not necessary anymore. So I would look at those they fit me, they look great, whatever, but I'm not wearing them all the time anymore. I would go and look at, can I pull some favorites out of this list? Can I reduce this population by half or can I get it down to a quarter of what it is and release the rest into the wild, let somebody else wear them and, you know, save them against the possibility that I have to put on adult clothes one day. If, if it's just a temporary transition, like, you wear um, nice clothes all day long every day and you're in between jobs or you're, uh, you're, you went back to school and then you're going to get out of school and go back to work or something. If there's some um, future for these clothes that you can envision, that's a real possibility, not just making up an excuse. If you can come up with something that there's a possibility you might roll them back into your life, 
Okay, but if you can't, if your life, like all of us, your life has changed and you have moved on to a new environment, a new process, a new way of living that these clothes don't really suit, then I would get rid of m most and, and keep some. And do that a couple of times over time. Like right now, maybe you can get rid of half of them and then let six months go by and see where you are and then get rid of half of those again. And, you know, eventually you will either be down to the ones that you consider keepsakes and that you want to keep forever, or you will get down to a small working pile that is designed to cover your new work life where once a week, you have to go to a business meeting and the rest of the time you're on zoom in your home clothes and you don't have to get all dressed up. So um, you can filter it down to a much smaller workable pile. If you're lucky enough to stay the same size and continue to be in good shape and your clothes will always fit, then you don't get the natural filter of I can't wear that anymore, which means that you're going to have to make decisions that are not just based on whether it fits. You're going to have to make decisions based on, whether you, you led with, I don't wear these anymore. And so if you don't wear them anymore, then, and you still want to continue to buy and, and add things to your closet, you're going to have to let go of things that actually work, but you don't wear anymore. Like then it becomes the only filter becomes, I'm not wearing it. And then it needs to go out. Some people keep their figure for forever. Well, if you have 50 years of clothes in your closet, I'm guessing you can't see any of it. So <laughs> It's the downside of being thin. You don't have your fat to help you fil filter your clothes out like <laughs> the rest of us. <laughs> okay, one last comment, and then we're, out, we're really out of time. Oh, okay. Abby said, I, I le really like this one. Abby said, I tried to do the Steve Jobs as a white T-shirt and plain pants. You know, Steve Jobs, like, always had the same oh, yeah, thing yeah. On, at all times. I don't know if he had 10 of them or just the one <laughs> right we can only hope that it was fresh every day she said i went to resale shops and only looked at the white i had a chance to see and try different brands i didn't know about makes it easier to toss if it doesn't work out long term oh good point that's interesting and the idea of deciding that okay i'm gonna, this is what my uniform is going to be that certainly narrows down your your shopping right <laughs> it really focuses what you're going after that's kind of cool. And I guess that's the whole concept of a capsule wardrobe anyway. It's like you go looking and you go looking for very specific pieces and there it's a small collection. It's not a big collection. And, and really it's like anti store display, right? When you go into a store, there's 4 million choices. And if you are trying to focus on a capsule wardrobe, then you're going to ignore, you know, 99 out of hundred of those choices and go for the white shirts. <laughs> That's awesome. I don't think I'd be that brave, but I do have to say that um, I really like being able to wear scrubs every day. I like the mental release. You know, I spent a long time getting dressed and going to a business office every day and, um, you know, keeping those clothes fresh and um, trading them out and buying new every season and, you know, changing things to how they fit as I changed my size over my lifetime and that was a lot of action and, you know, being able to wear scrubs as a professional, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> and it's easy and they're easy to clean and it makes my laundry day fabulous. And I have some nice clothes for when I hang out with my friends or whatever. And let me just tell you, they're gathering dust right now because I'm not seeing anybody out in the world. So, right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to come back to you for some a final thought on this topic. But first, a couple of announcements. I want to remind our viewers and listeners that our YouTube channel has more than 100 videos on lots of organizing topics. Go to cfhou.com slash YouTube. And while you're there, click on subscribe and you'll get notifications whenever we post something new. Yay. Next week, our webcast will be as usual on Tuesday at noon central time. Our topic is all good things must come to an end. Whether we like it or not, we lose interest in recreational pursuits or we lose the capacity to pursue them. 
when the thrill is gone, what was, one, what was once essential equipment becomes nothing but clutter, takes up valuable space and living with it can make us feel as if we failed or been defeated. We're gonna be talking about hobbies, crafts, and sports that we've left behind, how to accept our life changes, evaluate our collections, and let go of the old to clear space for new passions. The topic is crafts, hobbies, and sports. Get out of what you're no longer into. Okay, Gail, final, final thoughts on style. Okay, if the style is truly disposable and constantly changing and quickly out of fashion, then you're going to spend a lifetime buying new to replace existing items that are still in good shape. If you don't want to drown in that lifetime of rotating fashion, you'll need a process to rotate it out as well as in. Just like men's toys, it is not actually true that those who die with the most clothes win. I think it's better to send those clothes on to the next user now while they can still be worn rather than having your family donate them all in a big lump when you're gone. And they are long since too far gone to be wearable. If style is disposable, then you have to dispose of it. That's my final thought. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by going to cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please send us your questions and topic suggestions in the YouTube comments. And you can always reach us through our website at clutterfairyhouston.com. Yay, I did the signs correctly this week. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We're so glad that you came to join us, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.